Welcome back, Double Teamed Fam. How are we doing today? Today we welcome Susanna Weiss, a feminist writer and author of Subjectified. And sexologist. Sorry. Okay, I knew I forgot one word right there. Um, yeah, we're we're stoked to have you. How are you? Thank you. I'm good. How are you? We're good. We're good. Okay, I have to be a little honest. We haven't read through all of this, mm -hmm. um, but we're definitely very excited to to talk about it. So, um, I guess I wanted to dive. Well, first, can you explain sexologist? Like, what what does that term mean to you? Because when I heard that, I was mm -hmm. like, okay, interesting. I want to know more about it. What is that? It's a pretty broad term. People, a lot of people use it. Um, it generally means that you have some advanced education in sexuality. So okay. for me, I have a master's degree in sexual health and a few different sex educator certifications. It's like a sex educator, but like a level up, I think. Um, kind of like Nadej. Okay. N yeah. Nadej is a sexologist. So did so. you have to take that class in college where they like show you all kinds of porn and you just get like used to oh, it? Oh, that's called a SAR, I think not in college, but I did that for my sex educator certification. Um, well, it wasn't just porn. We had to watch different videos, like videos on sex and aging, like a video about like a teacher who slept with her student and explore our reactions to it and see what we're triggered by and where the limits of our own like ability to help people are. That's interesting. I'm curious, what were some of your like limits that you encountered in that? If you want to talk about them, if not, it's totally cool. Like, is there anything that you were like, oh, hard pass? <laughs> uh, I mean, I would have difficulty like scat play. I think yeah. I would have difficulty assisting someone in engaging in that mm -hmm. if they were like, OK, how do I like find like the best, I don't know, scat play? I would be like, OK, yeah. I can. <laughs> yeah, I totally get that. I am also on that boat. I would agree with you there. That's also a hard limit. Yeah, I oh, I do not want to yuck anyone's yum, but I just don't <laughs> understand it at all. So. Yeah, that's mm. interesting. And then like what when you were getting all those certifications and whatnot, like what was your favorite part of it? Like what what spoke to you the most in all of your training? I did a training called um, sexological body worker training, which that's somebody who is a hands on sex educator. So they wear gloves and they will touch you to teach you about your body. Not they don't sleep with you, but they might sexually stimulate you depending on what issue you come in with. Um, so I trained in that. I don't do that. But the training was super interesting. It was a little more woo woo than the rest. We learned about breath work to like increase sexual pleasure mm -hmm. and like meditations to like connect the heart with the genitals and i i really like the woo woo stuff so i like that oh <gasps> that we is are very woo woo wait <laughs> meditation huh i used to do where like i would kind of get into a meditative state um and then masturbate and mm. i always thought that was dope and it would be really fun to see what like came up so i don't know if you've ever tried that but highly recommend I had, well, an interesting sexual experience after a psychedelic ceremony. Ooh. I had a hands-free orgasm from listening to a hypnosis tape. Wait, what? <laughs> okay, wait, what was this hypnosis tape? It was like, <laughs> like I don't know. Like no if one was touching you? Right. It was amazing. There was this video. It's called um, Hands-Free Orgasm for Women. Erotic Hypnosis, Hands-Free Orgasm for Women. You could probably look it up. I, I had just come out of a Iboga ceremony, which is this really powerful psychedelic. And I like had this urge to see, I don't know where it came from. I was just like, I want to see if I could have a hands-free orgasm. So I just like typed it in and it was this like, it lasted for like minutes. Like, <laughs> and it was just from this dude being like, don't come until I tell you to. <laughs> what? <laughs> This sounds hot. I, I kind of want to try this. I will say one time I did, I did a psychedelic ceremony. And in, in the trip that I was in, um, at one point I was like, I really want to orgasm. Like I want to come. And I was just like laying there, like tripping balls in the, but it was like a ceremony, like a true ceremony. And, um, it didn't happen, but like I got close, like I edged a lot for it. I Wait, don't know did you how touch long. yourself or it was nope. all mental. It was all mental. I didn't. Mm -hmm. No, my hands were like I was like a freaking mummy the whole time. Just like this. <laughs> um, 
But uh, yeah. Was, it was what just, uh, substance was it? Mushrooms. Wow. Yeah. yeah. And I was like, you know, I didn't get there and I was like, that's okay. Maybe I'm just not aligned with this orgasm. But it did feel nice at like in the sense You're also that, in a public setting. I mean, there were I other know. people around. But it, it was, and I, w- and I wanted everyone else to have an orgasm too. I was like, I hope everyone else comes. <laughs> no, but like I was, it was just all in my head. It was all in my head. Wow. And I, yeah, it was so weird. It was so weird. It I don't even know how long Because you could have dream orgasms. It's yeah. like some part of your brain shuts off, I think. But I've also had dreams where I'm like receiving sexual stimulation but can't come. And I'm like, why can't I come? And then it's because I'm dreaming. Mm. <laughs> I hate that. I actually found that recently. Like I keep having these dreams where like something sexual is happening in the dream. And I really want to <laughs> orgasm. And then instead I wake up. And I, I wake up with like what I equate to like the female version of blue balls. And I'm like, yo, <laughs> we couldn't just keep the dream going a little longer. I was almost there. And it just doesn't happen. And it makes me really sad. <laughs> See, so. I I feel like I usually come and then I wake up after and then I feel like the aftershocks of it and I'm like, well, that was strange. But then most of the time I just have to pee. <laughs> so, <clears throat> yeah. Interesting. So when did this all kind of like start for you? So you studied it in college. Was that kind of around the time that you were just having more kind of curiosities around like exploring like the educational part of sex. I'm curious how this came to be. Like, how did you pick that major? Well, yeah, I talk about it in the book a little bit. I had an eating disorder like during high school and during college. I think what actually healed me was having positive sexual encounters that led me to see my body as more than an object Mm -hmm. and to appreciate how it could feel and to see that like I think a source of my eating disorder was feeling like an object and feeling like I'm just here for men's pleasure. So then to see that's not the case, like, was very healing. And that got me interested in sexuality. Um, Like, I don't know, I had like my first hookup the week before college started. And so I started to see how beautiful it could be. And I took a sexuality workshop and it was just this shame-free environment. It was like very... um, we had to refer to one another as fee, which was a gender neutral pronoun at the time. It was just very accepting. And that's what I found. I feel like people, yeah, people who study sex or are like sexuality professionals are just very accepting people. Mm-hmm. No, I would agree. We have a lot of friends that um, have studied sexuality and they all talk about the classes they took. And I'm like, I can't believe you were doing this in college. Um, Meanwhile, I, I was in organic chemistry one and two and failing miserably. <laughs> and I was flying airplanes and not, you know, it was like completely different. So, was, so when I hear about all those classes, I'm like, that sounds so fun. I wish I had known that that was like an option for like a major and like a study when I was in college. But we were also, I was in Oklahoma. Were you in California? I was in Rhode Island. Rhode Island. Okay. Is that a pretty progressive state? Would you say sexually? Uh, I don't know about the rest of the state, but Brown, the school I went to is definitely known for being progressive. Oh, wow. Oh, you went to Brown. That's, oh, that's dope. That is yeah. A, that's really dope. That's a designer degree. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> uh, I think so. Yeah, no, it's a great, great school. I love that though. Okay, and then I'm curious: were these? You said you had some really positive sexual experiences. Like, were they with men or women? Like, if you care to say, because I'm, I would be curious if it was a man that actually like made you feel safe, because you don't yeah. always find that. Yeah, my first experience was with a man. He, I met him on a beach. Um, I was 17. Like, It was the summer right before college. My friend and I went to the beach with my family. And at night, uh, we decided to go to the beach by ourselves. And there was this guy we met there. And we just started talking about sex. And then things became sexual between us. And he just went down on me all night and nothing else. And I was like, wow, this is amazing. Like, why oh, that was I- it? Oh, that's so nice. That's <laughs> oh. nice. Why have I been taught this is something men take from me? Like, yeah. he just gave me something. And- well, I mean, I think that's beautiful. And that is like, kind of, you know, surprising. And I wasn't, I didn't mean my question was like a jab to men, but like when I think about my initial sexual experiences, a lot of it was centered around like the man, you know, and it's like, kind of like, like, I think my first experience was with a, with like my boyfriend at the time. And I don't think he ever like went down on me until like I went down on him like repeatedly, you know? So it was like, it wasn't not like a super giving environment. So I think that's awesome that he was like willing to like just focus on you and not make it about him and like give you that experience. That is beautiful. 
So, yeah. Yeah. And that was also what got me fired up was people judged me for it. Like some of my friends were like, don't let a man use you or like, you know, don't um, don't be a slut or whatever. And I was like, but that's not what's happening. Yeah. I saw there was a big problem with how we view women as sexual beings. Mm -hmm. And I imagine that's what brought you to this book. Yeah. So, I love that it, yeah, you crossed out objectified and made it subjectified. I thought that was really cool. Yeah. And the I is in I because it talks about seeing through your own eyes and mm-hmm. using yeah. the word I to speak of yourself. I don't know if everyone will get that, but now I'm saying it. I actually didn't notice that until you pointed it out. Now I see it. Okay. That makes yeah. total sense. That's cute. We like really struggled over that I, like to resize it and reposition it so it didn't like overlap with the F. Mm. Oh, I get that. <laughs> yeah. From a production standpoint, I could see. Okay, well, let's talk about it. So for so, what made you want to write this book? Yeah, what was the inspiration behind it? I was just thinking about like my career. So I've been a sex journalist for nine years. And I was just thinking about like what is the theme of my work? And the biggest theme I thought was the objectification of women. And I thought about, well, what, what would the opposite be? And I thought about this, com- this sort of uh, class I was in in college where the professor said, and she was quoting either, I remember her quoting maybe Lusa Rigori or maybe Catherine McKinnon. I'm not 100% sure, but she was saying that this thinker said, why do we say like man penetrates woman rather than woman envelops man? And I Mm. thought about how we put uh, men at the subject of the sentence and women at the object, like after the verb. And I thought, so what if we made women the subjects? What if we, like, that could be a route out of objectification to literally make women subjects in our sentences. Mm. And so that's why every chapter is a verb and talks about how women can be the subject of that verb, like, look and want and like Mm -hmm. you know to think about what we look at what we want what we like rather than just being looked at being liked being wanted oh I love that so okay and well because I was looking at like okay I was reading a little bit like you know here and there and then um also I really want to read this section that's like I like you're just not that into that (laughs) um I was starting to read that section on the way here because I was like oh wait that I need to see what this is about. Um, Okay. I walk. I feel. I reveal. I look. I ask. I create. I want. Yeah, I think, you know, and especially when it comes to, like, being objectified, like, I think back to, like, my earliest experiences, and it was usually me, like, oh, I feel like I have to make sure that I'm being, you know, I'm giving all of myself to this man or to this person. Um, especially sexually, and that got me in a few uh, very not-so-fun situations. Um, But then, you know, like, I I feel like as I've become more, like, sexually empowered and just, like, going through my my sexuality, my sex life, being in relationships, being in casuals, um, you know, partnerships, blah, 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 I've realized I'm like, okay, it's, you know, it's an equal thing. He, whoever I pleasure, they pleasure me and it should be equal and it should be very like fun and you know when you do find especially as a woman like when you do find your empowerment and like oh like you know what's the saying it's like you know basically like my pussy is power you know like yeah no exactly (laughs) pussy power yeah where it's like okay like they want me just as much as I want them so yeah that's how I think about it or at least if it's not like completely even like at least make it to where like it feels like the relationship or like the dynamic as a whole is you know has an ebb and a flow where everyone feels like satisfied with it rather than just like one person or it being one-sided um I was gonna ask like hold on hand me the book real quick where was that one section oh yeah the politics of pubes that's my favorite chapter is it okay wait I'm curious what's your stance on pubes I have been (laughs) on and off with my own pubes like right now right now I'm off Uh, but so it's really interesting I wrote the book proposal like about so at that time I was very pro body hair I didn't shave anything and 
I wrote it about how like women say they shave for themselves and how I question that because are we ever really doing anything just for ourselves, especially women, we're internalizing the male gaze and we are like wanting to look a certain way because of that. And then as like right before I got the book deal, I decided to experiment with removing my pubic hair Mm -hmm. and I really liked it. And I was like, crap, how do I write this chapter? (laughs) And um, because something about it felt, it felt like it got me in touch with a different side of myself, like a more stereotypically girly side of myself, which I actually liked. Yeah. And so I, I wrote a chapter that I think includes both perspectives. That's like, yeah, we do internalize the male gaze. And also sometimes that's fun and sometimes that's hot. And it's not always about the male gaze, but even if it is like, if that is what brings you pleasure, like that submission, which I, it kind of does for me, then we should just find joy wherever we can because patriarchy isn't very joyful. So if it mm-hmm. brings us joy at all, then we should revel in that. I will say it's funny that pubes comes up or body hair in general because I remember earlier I was at the gym and I was feeling slightly, for some reason, insecure um, just because of just a breakup that I'm going through, whatever. And I was feeling insecure. And I see this really attractive girl. And I was like, I almost like wanted to like, you know, start comparing myself to her, right? And then I like, I thought I saw like, she had like a bunch of armpit hair. And for some reason, my, you know, the patriarchy that's been ingrained in me was like, oh, okay, then she's you know, she's not as cute, right? And I'm like, and then I stopped myself for a moment because I had that, that thought came through and I was like, wait, what? That, no, what the fuck? She's still beautiful whether she has armpit hair or not. Like, you know, whether she chooses to shave everything like a fucking dolphin or, you know, let everything grow fully willy-nilly, like that does not devalue her. And I just remember like, you know, I was like thinking to myself, I'm like, okay, like, you know, we're all beautiful in our own way. Um, and especially like when it, when it comes to like pubic hair, it's not that, or, you know, and body hair in general, like it's not that big of a deal. So I just, I remember I was having that thought earlier and I was like, ugh, I would just, yeah, like you said, patriarchy and also just having, you know, that internalization of like, you know, we think that a guy wants it to be smooth all the time. And it was just like, yeah. I have been shocked by how many men have been grossed out by my pubic hair. Really? And like, Yeah, like I have had men be shocked that it's there. Like mm-hmm. one guy like started fingering me and he's like, what's that? <laughs> what? <laughs> what? Does he not know gr- hair grows there? What the fuck? <laughs> I will say I'm thankful in the fact that like, you know, the times that like I've hooked up with guys and it's like, yeah, maybe I didn't shave for a few days or whatever. And some of it grew back, you know, they're always like, I don't care. And I was like, okay, I once I had a guy, my legs were like a little stubbly and he was like, I actually kind of like it. You can keep it. And I was like, I'm going to shave it because I prefer smooth legs. I like the feel of like smoothness, but I do also, cause like I've been with women and I've been with plenty of women that have like had hair down there and like, it doesn't bother me. And so do I have my preferences? Yes. But like, it also like, it's just not a big deal. Um, but it just cracked me up when that guy was like, no, 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 you can leave it. And I was like, Okay. I mean, I'm not going to like leave it indefinitely, but I will in this moment not feel self-conscious about it anymore just because you were like, okay, it's cool. But yeah, I don't know. I do laser, which has like made it to where like it doesn't like really like grow back, which is great and all. But um, I'm trying to remember back to when I did have pubic hair and I'm like, well, damn, what was that experience like? Because in high school, I didn't know what to like do with it. Yeah. You know, especially when you're young, you're like, what, what am I supposed to do with it? Like shave it? Do I leave it? You know, what am I supposed to shave? What do I leave? It's just, yeah, it's, it's annoying. And then I have my armpit tasers as well, but I wanted to do my legs, but then I was like, that's just so much trouble. And I'm like, why, you know, I can just in the winter leave it. No one's going to really be paying attention. And then when I'm ready to shave it, shave it. It's fine. But anyways, I loved that. Or when you were talking about the politics of people, like that's a great chapter, <laughs> and I never know what's in the bush or not. But I think everyone should just do what makes them happy. So, well, I think there's a lot of points of like objectification, like and especially I'm assuming like when you were like writing that, you could just you know you were thinking about everything like as a whole, like you know, because there's a section in there about like the nipple, 
you know, and it's like, you know, if you think about it, a lot of the times whenever, um, you know, women can't go topless because we as a or society in general objectifies the breast, right? Which, mm-hmm. you know, if you really think about it, it's really just the nipple, but a guy's nipple is fine, but a women's isn't. So, you know, it's always weird to think about kind of like that double standard in a sense. Cause then, you know, take it back to pubes. It's like, it's not like men shave their armpits or their legs. So actually, have you ever been with a guy that has like shaved like his legs or his pubes or anything? Yeah, my ex was German and apparently that's a thing they do there. Really? Oh, we were just talking about Germans. And how did you (laughs) feel about it? Like what, what did it bring up for you? Not a lot. Like I don't have a strong reaction to it. I think I do prefer it a little more with hair. It just seems like more mature, but Mm. it's not a deal breaker. See, yeah, it's not a deal breaker for me either. But if there is like an excessive amount of like chest or back hair, then I'm like, "Mm, can we wax some of this? (laughs) See, I dated a guy that was like a bear. Like he had so much hair like everywhere. But I was this was in college. Uh, But I was still just so insanely attracted to him. I was like, I didn't care. Like, not even the slightest. It was warm. (laughs) So it was warm like yeah. what hugging him on my interest was it like, soft yeah Why okay it be soft well i don't know i was just curious like if it's like if it feels like scratchy or soft well no because he didn't shave it so so it oh, that's what i'm saying because you know like when you shave it and like it grows back and then it's like thicker the hair yeah mm-hmm. interesting so you said that was one of your favorite sections what's another one that like really you really enjoyed writing or like the writing process of it the last chapter, I think, the one, it's sort of like a conclusion. It, it talks about that um, instance in my class in college where the professor said that thing about women enveloping rather mm-hmm. than just being penetrated. And I actually have a tattoo. Uh, I could show you it that is sort of based on that concept. It's an octopus, which the octopus has been seen as a symbol of women's sexuality because it's like a pussy. Um, it's engulfing or enveloping. I see it. Yeah, that's, that's like cool. engulfing the ship in this scenario. Um, well, I love that. Yeah. And I mean, I hadn't even had intercourse at that point. And I feel like that shaped how I went into it like a year later was I thought like I want to make sure I'm not just being penetrated, that I'm enveloping, that I'm an active participant and i'm not just being used but this is like power there it is (laughs) but do you feel like you accomplished that in your experience or like do you think like going in with that perspective really like changed the experience for you yeah i think so i think i just knew that it was for my pleasure at least as much as my partners Mm -hmm. and that it wasn't like a violent act because also like i don't know the way people talk especially about the first time is like it's going to hurt and Mm -hmm. he's going to take something from you yeah and like that wasn't my experience my experience was like i'm going in for my pleasure and also i had used toys so i like already knew my body i didn't have pain i think i don't know i never had like pain with penetration even like the first time i used a toy but I just like I was very mindful of like this should be to please me. Mm. See, sometimes I wish my first, you know, five years of sexual experience had been more like that, you know, because I think because and I was actually in therapy not that long ago going over this. I was like, wait, my intro to sex was not that great. You know, like it was just same. Not about me at all. (laughs) I didn't make it about me. I wanted to make it about someone else. And I think that's where my people pleasing came in. So. I think I'm kind of glad that I was a nerd in high school and I like didn't start like having sex really until college because I think I could I could have had some bad experiences in high school. I, I started becoming sexually active at the very end of my high school career. And then before that, I was very like hesitant and timid. So I didn't do much. But the person that like I lost my virginity to, I barely knew. And like I barely had any sort of you know connection with so then that kind of like set the precedence where you know a lot of the men after that in college it was more just like hookups and me you know trying to fill some sort of like void um through casual experiences um and then it wasn't until much later on that I was like oh wait I shouldn't have done that 
Oops. I was like in such denial that I was having sex. I was like calling it everything but sex. I was like, you know, like A, it's only anal or B, it's just a tip or like, you know, like I was like d- in denial that I was like actually having sex. That was the first like year of sex. And then finally I was like, no, you know, I'm, I'm sexually active. I need to just like embrace that. But it was because of shame. I was like, okay, if I'm, you know, if it's not going all the way in, then it's not sex. And so then <laughs> no one can call me a slut or whatever. Like that was my rationalization. It was horrible. Anyways, <clears throat> why are you? Don't laugh at me. <laughs> it's not oh, ridiculous. And I'm curious. Okay, so for your first experience, like, was it with a partner that was like a long term relationship? Like, did that kind of like help th- make the? Well, and, or, wait, y'all met at the beach. Did it go no, further? No, so that he just went down on me. So I'm talking about like my first time fucking, which was like years later. Okay, oh, yeah. So there oh, was a gap. Okay. So there was a gap in between the two. Interesting. And how, man, how did you not, like, if you, if someone had gone down on me, I would have, like, immediately been so, like, horned up that I would have just wanted to, like, keep <sighs> beep bopping around. I'm curious why the gap or, like, was, what was that time for you? I don't know. I think it's kind of like what you said. I did learn that intercourse was a bigger deal. Mm. And maybe in a way it is because it could lead to pregnancy. I I don't know. And also because I'd heard the stories that it could hurt or that like you'll get attached to the person. I did hear all those oh, things. So maybe yeah. I, I wanted to be careful and make sure I was in love with the person. But I don't know if that was necessary or if that was just like internalized slut shaming. Mm. Or maybe a little, like a little bit of I mean, sure, some of the shame could have been there, but also it could have been like you wanting to just like make sure you take like a good slow approach to it and like whatever you feel comfortable with that too i actually Mm -hmm. love that because i mean like we talk a lot about non-monogamy and you know i'm the kind of person that like as soon as something excites me i want to go like experience all of it and i want to just like dive right in i'm not good at taking things slow Mm -hmm. so that's what i was saying for you to be like oh yeah someone went down on me and then you know you wait a while before you have sex i would be like to to me i'd be like oh i would just go like right in and i just keep going and like you know wait what sign are you Oh, yeah. What's your sign? Virgo. Oh, I was like, I knew it was going to be Earth. That's why. <laughs> That's why that you have patience. <laughs> That's why oh. I think you have patience. Yeah. <laughs> and so, but in non-monogamy, like I, especially, you know, after years of like exploring it, I realized that like, I think people should definitely approach it from a standpoint of like taking it really slow and like, you know, maybe trying one thing or trying just a little bit and then kind of like really sitting with that before like you start diving into the next, like rather than just like snowballing into everything, because I think that can make for a better experience as you kind of like, you know, do something, try something, sit with it, see what you learn from it, see how you feel. And then like when you're ready, continue on to the next. So yeah, I'm trying to take a slower approach at things lately. I don't know if it's working well for me, but I'm trying nevertheless um so you said you also write other or like you wrote other pieces like what what did that look like was that like for like magazines like or you know like other publications what was that like i've written for the new york times the washington post glamour men's health uh, team vogue a, a bunch of places mainly about sex and relationships i also write about psychedelics those are like my main topics love that and so Do you tend to lean more towards like men's or women's like which or is it just kind of both like do you or like do you tend to focus more on like the women's side of it? Uh, Yeah, I'm curious. Yeah, probably. Okay. But both. Interesting. And what have you learned about men in the research that you or like in the things that you've written about or discovered? Hmm. I'm curious. (laughs) (laughs) I love that reaction. Hmm. No, because I'm thinking of, I mean, men have a lot of sexual shame and trauma as well Mm -hmm. and a lot of men want Mm -hmm. to better understand consent and Mm. I'm also a coach so I'm thinking of like what men come to me about um and also yeah a lot of them just don't know they're not trying to be bad lovers they just don't know and they haven't had the chance to learn how to be a good partner especially to women Mm. um and I, I hope I can contribute to them knowing a little more. And what do you what what do you think their biggest lessons tend to be around? I think, well, a lot of men are surprised by a woman having a sex drive. Like, and that is, I feel like there's this black black and white thinking where 
just because I am very openly sexual online, men will approach like DM me and just like dick pics and, you know, just like, hey, like you're sexy or something like they don't realize there's a, there's nuance and a woman can be very sexual and also not want to share that with everyone. Mm. So I think understanding that nuance is important. Yeah. And also like if if men understand, yeah, women do have strong sex drives. They like are interested in sex. You don't need to manipulate them into sex. You just have to be a decent person. Like, yeah, that goes a long way. Just being respectful of boundaries. And mm -hmm. I think there would be fewer incels if men understood that. I would it's agree. like when we do Q&As and the men are like, how do I get my wife to sleep with me more? <clears throat> and my advice is always like, well, have what? you had, have you talked to her? Have you made her feel loved and seen and heard and appreciated? And are you taking the steps to be a good partner? Because I can guarantee you if you are making her feel safe and wanted and loved and supported in all areas of life outside of the bedroom that's just gonna make her want to fuck you all the time or that much more mm -hmm. so yeah i get what you're saying there for sure i have it's funny that you say that you that men are like surprised women have sex drives because I, I do think it's true because they're probably taught that like women don't want sex and they like you know you have to like convince them and mm. blah 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 and it's like no we we're we're I think women are hornier than men. I think women have better imagine, imagination than men. I think they have more of a drive. I think they're more creative when it comes to the bedroom. I think they mm -hmm. want to explore a lot more. But a lot of times you need a safe environment mm -hmm. and where they feel loved and cared for and cherished to really open that up. Like once you liberate a woman sexually, it is like far above where men ever reach. You know, <laughs> like if you think about like a man's top fantasy, like... <laughs> To women, you know, and then <laughs> that's it. And then think about like, you know, look at the books that women have written about sex, like the, you know, the creative there or, you know, the, the vision and like the desires and everything are so much more creative than men and some, but I, yeah. So I just think if men put more work into making their women and their partner feel safer and better and everything, mm -hmm. you'd be surprised at like what that brings out of the woman, I think. Mm -hmm. Well, I love to see like men that put in the work to like better their you know emotional intelligence and their ability to you know be a true partner you know because you know, when, when two people put in the work you can tell and you know women tend to be very introspective and like to put in that work and put in that emotional intel you know or work on their emotional intelligence and then when you see a guy do that i think it's just it's night and day like you can see the difference for sure because then the guy is going to be like you know i know when a guy has done work when they put nearly all the focus on me on in during sex because mm -hmm. i was like okay they obviously want to or they're not just thinking about themselves they're thinking about this as a whole as the bigger picture and you know like how they can you know provide that pleasure and that safety and all that so yeah, i always say you can tell when a guy's been trained by a woman <laughs> and it's true yeah cooked <laughs> yeah cooked um Someone so cooked here. i was reading this you mentioned group masturbation circles this is something i have not done can you please explain yeah have you heard of those betty dodson workshops no or Betty Dawson, well, she is deceased now, but she was this well-known sex educator who would hold circles in her apartment mm -hmm. where women, like a dozen or so women, get together naked and talk about their bodies and their feelings about their sexuality, and they masturbate together. It's like a two-day thing. On the second day, you just all have vibrators, and you all sit there and masturbate and just talk about your experiences. And I'm not going to lie. That sounds terrifying. <laughs> Wait, so you did you did this? Yeah, I did a couple of them. Oh, wait. How was it? Yeah, tell us. Yeah, what? How did you feel after? Was it? Because, I mean, I'm, I, I've been to plenty of sex parties, but I'm not much of an exhibitionist. And if a bunch of people were, like, around me masturbating while I'm also masturbating and that you can, like, make eye contact with people, I think I would kind of, <laughs> I, would, I would probably freak out a little bit. Not freak out, but, you know, just, like, have a reaction. If you have, like, a Hitachi on the highest power, like, it would probably overcome the freak out. Like... <laughs> 
<laughs> okay, we've all, we, at least I've experienced the Hitachi at the highest power, and I would agree. Made. Yeah. Well, no, because I think about it, okay, I think about, like, a masturbation circle. Everyone's facing in, and it's intentional. And like you said, there's, like, you know, it's a whole, you know, little ceremony thing. And then I think about sex parties, and it's, like, everybody's willy-nilly and, like, doing, doing their own want. thing. Yeah. yeah. Uh, a masturbation circle just sounds way more intimate. <laughs> And I already have enough of a problem just like, you know, when I'm masturbating on my own, I already feel enough like, I don't want to say shame. My masturbation journey has been so weird, but there are still moments where I'm like masturbating and I'm like, oh, I don't like that I'm doing this, but you know, like I want to and it feels good. Um, So the thought of like doing that in front of other people, terrifying, just terrifying. Was it always with a vibrator? Yeah, they they give you Hitachis with condoms around them. Uh-huh. And yeah, it people are kind of lost in their own world. It doesn't feel like you have the spotlight on you, although people kind of feed off each other. Like I feel like one person will moan and then another one will moan. <laughs> Everyone will be like, okay, cool, I can moan now. So yeah, I totally get that. Yeah. Interesting. Um, Interesting. But, but yeah. not not using fingers. Oh, it's optional. I mean, you're given the Hitachi, so most people just do that. Yeah. Whatever you want, really. Um, Yeah, the last one I went to, I was getting over. I was dumped by a guy in a really awful way, so I was feeling really bad about myself. And I felt like, yeah, and I was feeling self-conscious, naked, in front of all these other women, also naked. And I just, I found, like, this goddess inside me. Like, I just when we were doing the masturbation, it, it was almost like a spirit was moving me. I'm like, okay, now I'm going to like stand up masturbating. And then like, <laughs> and then I'm going to have another orgasm, like sitting down and now I'm going to like do a dance. And it was like, I've like stepped into this. Um, Love and then that. the other women like witnessed me. One was like, yeah, you're like a goddess. <laughs> yeah. It, it was, it was healing to experience that. Like, especially I felt like I, I felt kind of threatened by the other women, like, oh, she's thinner than me or she's whatever. Mm-hmm. And then like they were complimenting me. And mm-hmm. That was really healing. See, I hate that. Why is it? Because that's that's what I'm experiencing as I'm going through a breakup is I why is it that we are left by someone or, you know, a relationship ends and then all of a sudden we feel so like into like you know you feel insecure and then you look at you know other people and you immediately start comparing yourself to them and it's like well why did this relationship ending have to you know cause me to now compare myself to others like why is I just every single time I experience that it blows my mind and I have to go through like literally a fucking 50 long affirmations list of like I am worthy I am loved I am beautiful I am sexy I am you know you know, this is my body and it, you know, does everything for me. And, you know, I'm thankful to have that, you know, and then, but yet, (laughs) so it's like, it's, it's such like a mind fuck for me that it's like you, someone, you know, leaves your life and all of a sudden it's like you question your worth just because someone left and, you know, it's your ego. Yeah. It was also the way it happened for me. He left me for another woman. Yeah. Oh. Well, I was a great casual thing. She was like great for a relationship. So that was what brought that on. Well, I'm Uh sorry. And that's not true. You are also great for a relationship. Are you in a relationship currently? No, I'm not. Single? Okay. Mm -hmm. Are you looking or just, are you on the street? Are you on the porch? I heard (laughs) recently. The street. There was this TikTok that was like, you know, you're either like inside the house with the door closed, like you're in a relationship, you're on the porch, meaning you're just like kind of like observing, but not really participating or you're on the streets, like you're actively looking for people. I would say on the streets. You're on the streets. Yeah. (laughs) No, I'm on the streets too. And I'm not going to lie. You know, the other day I was like, I really wish I could just be at home with my boo, you know, but instead I got to go put myself out there to see if someone comes along. (laughs) And it's annoying, but, you know, it's fine. I still had fun that night. It was a great time. But sometimes I miss being at home. Mm. I'd say I'm, like, on the sidewalk. You're on the sidewalk? Yeah. It's like, I'm, you know, I could go to the porch. I could go to the streets. Kind of, like, you know, scared to take that step. But 
Interesting. Yeah. Do you work with couples as well, like in your coaching? Sometimes, yeah. Interesting. And what do you see like a lot of, like what are usually the main issues that you see when couples come to you? Like, Mismatched desires, either in terms of the amount of sex or the type of sex that people want, and then one mm -hmm. person feels pressured while the other feels um, frustrated, and it's just about like getting somebody, getting one person to not pressure the other, and also getting the other one to figure out what they like and how they can connect to their sexuality, so they want sex from a genuine place as opposed to just this my duty to please my partner. Oh, yeah. I totally see That's that. That's a lot. Yeah. Yeah. Well, because sometimes you want to make the person happy, but you're not feeling it yourself. Hmm. Or like it's not your cup of tea. I mean, that was the thing with like my ex-husband is that I was like a little bit more kinky than he was. And so I, I just got to the point where I'm like, don't even try because like I know it's not coming from a genuine place. So like it's totally fine. Let's just stick to like what feels genuine for you. And so... Uh, but we are non-monogamous, so it helped because then I'd go to other people who were kinky, and then they would hit me across the face, and I'd be like, okay, thank you. <laughs> Meanwhile, my husband was like, I can't hit you. <laughs> so that was my thing. Are you kinky, or are you more vanilla? I'm funfetti. I'm vanilla with some rainbow sprinkled in. <laughs> <laughs> okay, I love, I love that. that. Funfetti? <laughs> yeah. That is so cute. What are your What are your sprinkles? <laughs> I like a little bit of submission. Like I like being spanked, being called a good girl, stuff like that. It's interesting because like when you when I read this and I was like objectified and you changed it to subjectified <laughs> and like the whole premise of the book is like taking away from like being the object to, you know, being being the subject of the of the scenario. And I love that. But like, I thought to myself, I'm like, I'm also, I love that, but I'm also kinky and I love to be objectified every once in a while. Like, I don't mind being, you know, a human table for some, like in certain positions. I thought of the same thing. Yeah, exactly. So it's like, what, uh, do you cover that in the book or like, is what, what's your take on that? There's some of that in the pubic hair chapter because mm -hmm. I realized I think that was a bit of a kink for me was like shaving my pussy and like taking photos of it and like love it yeah <laughs> same same um I think that if you're a subject writing the sentence where you're an object you're still a subject <gasps> so if you're creating the scenario where you're an object you're still a subject that is a great way to look at it well, that. and I think that because when I was thinking about like how I like to be objectified in, you know, dominance and submission or, you know, when I'm having more kinkier sex, I thought about it that way, too, where it's like, well, in this situation, like I'm being object objectified the way I, that I want to. Like I have the power to, you know, decide how it's going to happen. You know, when I'm walking down the street and someone decides to roll their window down and scream something at me um cat call yeah cat call like uh, that's not me choosing that you know so that's just it being brought upon me um so that difference right there is definitely definitely notable so for these sprinkles submission for example like is that is that something that you want to like make sure you have in your relationship or is that like something that's like a little like it doesn't have to be on the table like if they're not kinky i'm curious I think probably yes. It doesn't have to be. Okay. Yeah, I need someone who can play the dom role, I think. Okay. Gotcha. I never thought about that. Is that like a immediate no if they're not? Yeah. I need to think about that. Okay. No, that's fair. Yeah. I'm glad that now. Like I'm for like my life partner, I would say yes. For someone yeah. like I could occasionally be the dom or occasionally just have it be vanilla. Okay. But for long term, you want to make sure that that piece of the puzzle is there. I think so. Love that. Yeah. I'm the same. I mean, well, with certain kinks, like not all of them, but like with some of them, I'm like, I need someone that's going to be like willing to do this because if I have to go like, you know, a really long time without it, I don't know. I mean, granted, the solution there, people would be like, oh, well, you can be non-monogamous and get from different people. But like lately, I've been looking for more monogamous. So which I know is kind of a shocker. But anyways, here we are. Monogamous. Monogamish. Okay. Yes. Monogamish. I've kind of undergone that transition myself. Like really? five years ago, I was like, I broke up with my partner because I was like, I think I'm non-monogamous. And he was like, I'm not. And I did date multiple people. None of them became serious. But after like five years, I'm like, no, I think I am monogamous. I think I just wanted time to explore. But ultimately, or maybe monogamish. Like, yeah, monogamish. But or just a sense of, you know like you said you just needed to explore it i think a lot of times when it comes to like different relationship structures 
so one will make more sense than the other at a certain point in your life and then later down the road it could flip-flop and i think like that's the important part especially mm-hmm. when if you're open-minded to non-monogamy um i think that's like a a big key lesson or you know way to look at it is that like you can be non-monogamous for some time um but if later on you aren't that's okay you're still just an open-minded individual exploring what type of relationship works for you at that time because we're all evolved you're evolving human beings mm-hmm. so yeah. now i was gonna ask as someone because i'm a bit of a writer creator myself and i'm curious what do you want people to feel when they read this book free i want it to free their minds Right? Like they say, free your mind and the rest will follow. I love that. <laughs> and I love that you had such an immediate response. You're like, you know what you want them to feel. My therapist and I talked about that. Really? I was like, she was the one who brought up free your mind and the rest will follow. Because I, I think I said, you know, I don't know if this book is so much written from my heart as like, it's not necessarily here to like make the world a better place. Although it, like... In a sense, it is, but it's more to like expand people's minds. Mm-hmm. And Love that. She was like, "That's okay. Free your mind, and the rest will follow." <laughs> yeah, I love that. Now, are you? Since you are a writer, do you feel like writing this inspired you to like maybe go on to write other books? Like, do you want to keep writing? You mm-hmm. know, or are you gonna kind of stick to like the articles and such? Because they are two very different styles types of writing. I understand that. Yeah, I'm working on my second book now, actually. it's I have the deal. It's like hopefully coming out at the end of next year. Nice. Um, and what's that one going to be about, if you can share? Yeah, it's called Eve's Blessing. So it talks about the normalization of women's pain and pleasurelessness. Um, in other words, the normalization of things like period pain, pain during sex, um, childbirth pain, which I know like most people think is normal. But um and also the normalization of women not enjoying sex and not orgasming basically this myth that being in a female body is a disadvantage um and talks about how i interviewed a bunch of women who underwent different physical health problems and different sexual problems and came out on the other end realizing that being female is amazing and they can have a great time in their bodies and i talk about my own journey with that as well And yeah, it ties back to this theme of Eve being cursed in the Garden of Eden. And I argue that women are actually blessed and that God didn't curse Eve. He blessed women. Yeah. I love (laughs) that. That one I really want to read for sure. Well, I like that you mentioned like, you know, normalizing that not everything has to be painful. Like you said, like with childbirth, with periods, with because I there's or even if it is like embrace it. Yeah. Well, no, but just in the sense of that, like, you know, I feel like when we're growing up like as girls like we're going to be told like oh this is going to be painful and this is going to be painful and this is going to hurt blah blah blah. and it's like well no like that's not you know our 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 bodies can do amazing things especially as women like we can literally birth a child like i think that's pretty cool like i don't want to do it but i think it's cool um but you know especially before modern day if you think about it like there weren't epidurals there weren't you know, mine all. <laughs> yeah, exactly. So and it's like pads. there were natural ways that we took care of our bodies that helped us feel like empowered and blessed and like, you know, truly feminine. Um, you know, as you said, like with Eve. So we're not cursed because we have these bodies. So your statement made me th- about pain made me think that I'm like, I wonder if that's why I became a masochist. <laughs> I'm like, mm-hmm. you know what? I'm just going to embrace this pain. <laughs> like, I'm just, it, I don't know. Maybe that's why. I would have to reflect on that a little bit. Well, thank you for joining us today. And for anyone that wants to find your book, where can they get it? Amazon. I hope you'll include the link somewhere. Oh, 100%. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. We can put it in the episode description. And it releases June 10th 10th in the U.S., May 24th in the U.K. Ooh, okay. Yeah, my publisher is in the U.K., so it comes out there first. Oh, nice. Oh, that's cool. How did you – do you have an agent? Mm -hmm. Oh, nice. Okay. We'll talk about it. I'm curious to <laughs> hear about <laughs> Anyways, okay, so we'll put the uh, the episode description, we'll put the link there. Is it going to be in any stores? I think so, but I'm not 100% sure which. Okay, gotcha. So Amazon's probably the easiest place to get it. Mm-hmm. Are you going to have an ebook version of it? Yeah. Nice. 
Are and you doing an audio? Yeah. <gasps> Who did you have to do the voice for the audio? I'm curious. They're still choosing someone, actually. It oh, seems really? a little late in the game, but yeah, I was just sent some options. You didn't want to do it yourself? I did, but they, like, I signed away my rights to that, so they oh. wanted a professional actor. Oh, interesting. Mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, because they have, I mean, it depends on the book. Like, I know Kate did her narration, but, um, but she was kind of... I mean, her publisher was more like boutique, but yeah, some of them will have like people that they work with for like their books. Interesting. Yeah. So I'm thinking if I ever wrote a book, I feel like I would love to narrate it, but then again, I feel like my voice is so not narration material. <laughs> Same. So. Same. Yeah. They'd be like, that's a funny way of saying that word with an A. <laughs> yeah. So. I mean, you're a podcaster. You must have some like vocal appeal. <laughs> 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 I don't know about my laugh, though. <laughs> um, I don't know. I'll, I'll have to ask my listeners if they like my voice. <laughs> I don't know. I think so. Yeah, I get, it gets a little, mine gets a little throaty or cackly. Anyways, thank you for joining us. We really enjoyed this. And yeah. yeah, this is a really great book. I hope people take a look at it, read it. And yeah, it was definitely very, like I said, we were kind of skimming through uh, throughout as we've kind of had it. And um the the pubes one for sure is one of my favorite i love it a lot but um there was a quote in it about the hair that you, what was it it was like how like even you know it still keeps growing even after you keep <laughs> yanking it out or whatever it was it, it was towards the end of the, the chapter yeah. yeah 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 and i love that because i was like you know what that's so true it keeps going despite the fact that everyone's like <laughs> taking it out like you're wrong it's like no i'm right no i'm yeah. right and i'm still gonna show up it is persisted that is for sure <laughs> Anyways, thank you for joining us today. We really appreciate it. Yeah. So, and you know, do you want to plug yourself like on Instagram? Yeah. Do you have? Yeah. You can follow me. Um, Twitter is Susanna Weiss, S-U-Z-A-N-N-A-H-W-E-I-S-S. -S -S, and Instagram is the reverse Weiss, Susanna. Oh, oh, very nice. Love that. And we can put that in the episode description as yep. well, too. And guys, y'all know where to find us at Double Team Podcast on Instagram and TikTok. DoubleTeamPodcast.com has all the relevant links. Don't forget, wear condoms. And we'll see you <laughs> next time. Yep. <laughs>